Well, thank you for a very comprehensive and extremely interesting lecture, which you managed to complete in a much shorter time than you had uh, predicted. So we have a little bit more time for questions than uh, I had anticipated. We have microphones on either side of uh, the room, if you would please go up to them if you have a question. And uh, please let us know your affiliation uh, and name as well. So let me start here. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, my name is Hillary Mathis. I recently started my master's degree at uh, the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Um, so this lecture tonight was fantastic, but so much of it focused on national political structures as a response to ethnic conflict and as a, a means of ameliorating conflict. But what recommendations would you have for situations like the Great Lakes region where perhaps national boundaries aren't as salient as in other situations? Thank you so much. Do you want to take a couple? or Sure, let's take a couple. Uh, Bill Schneider. Do you believe a one-state solution for Israel could work? <laughs> well, oh, I don't know. Should we take a third? Is that, yeah? Um, hi, Seth Kaplan from SICE. Um, two um, issues you've touched upon but didn't delve into as much as you could have. One, decentralization, and two, um, the robustness of institutions. So what I mean by that is, is decentralization, if you add that to the mix, instead of just looking at the centralized, the, 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 the national government, does that improve the picture? And then um, if institutions are very robust versus completely not robust, very weak, um, how does that change your results? Thank you. Take those. Sure. OK, uh, the Great Lakes. Um, uh, that's the first question from Hillary. And, and uh, the, the Great Lakes region around um, uh, the Congo Republic um, is a difficult area. There are uh, a, a lot of dispersed groups. There are some groups competing for power at the center, but there are many groups that are uh, attempting to control local areas. And there's also a very large international component where uh, armies from, uh, uh, from, other, from neighboring states have, have played a role. I'm sure there's some scope for devolution in a country like Congo. Congo is a very, very large uh, entity. And I think Al Stepan, last year's speaker, um, was uh, fond, is fond of saying that there is no really large country that, that has a democracy without a federation. So Congo, uh, Congo uh, would, would probably do well to do some devolution. But of course, the international side of it isn't going to make any of that easy. And the, and the, the conflicts in, in, the, in the Great Lakes region, um, as I say, have a large international component that isn't going away soon. Um, Bill Schneider's question about the, the one state solution uh, is a really easy one to answer. The answer is no. <laughs> if you're interested in ethnic domination, have a look at the one state solution and you will see that there will be, uh, in the first instance, majority domination of the minority. The minority will try to escape from it. The minority will then try to dominate the majority. We have lots of cases of this. In general, I think partition is not a great solution uh, to severely divided societies, but there are some cases around where after very long periods of hostility and hostilities, uh, you can't put a Humpty Dumpty back together again. And that's certainly the case with respect to Israel and Palestine. And then the third question about decentralization, I touched on the answer in my answer to the first one. Yes, decentralization often improves the picture and you get a lot of benefits from uh, decentralization, from devolution, from federalism. I actually have a piece on that someplace uh, called the, the Many Advantages of Federalism or words to that effect. There are about eight of them that you can get under ideal circumstances, but the circumstances are often not ideal. Um, there are some big hazards also to decentralization. Uh, you often get where you get new states or new regions which are clearly identified 
uh, with a certain population, you get son of the soil movements. That is to say, the people who classify themselves as indigenous tell the people whom they classify as immigrant to go someplace else. This is a very common phenomenon, actually, in federal states, and you have to have very good judicial institutions to enforce uh, equality of opportunity uh, uh, rights, and, and those are very often lacking. You also get um, a, a kind of reductio ad absurdum. You get uh, regressive claims, one after another, to a new state. If Group A and Group B are together in a particular federal unit, a state, let's call it, or a province, uh, and Group A uh, is where the resources are located, suddenly Group A may say, and has said in many cases, uh, please, uh, let's divide this state along the A-B line, and we don't have to share the resources then with the Bs. So you get those two very big problems, both of which are, are difficult to handle. The second one is usually handled by dividing the state in the end, and that's a bit of a shame. Okay, take please. one here next. Thanks very much. Uh, Don, as usual, it's an impressive talk. Thanks very much. Uh, my name's Lise Howard, and I'm a professor at Georgetown University. We have a lot of conversations these days about what might happen in Syria, so I want to ask you the Syria question. Um, what, com <laughs> what would come after Assad? Um, on, one hand, on the one hand, I'm hearing a lot of people talking about partition into three separate, possibly, states. Um, and on the other hand, a lot of people are talking about ethnic power-sharing, which I would call ethnic, ethnic power-sharing, oh. which I would call ethnocracy. So I'm wondering if you have ideas about Syria. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank uh, Abe Shulsky from the Hudson Institute. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting lecture. I, I was wondering whether it makes any difference in these cases whether in, in cases where the uh, minority group may be, in fact, higher social status. Uh, so one of the examples you had was Malaysia, where things seem to work fairly well uh, for a while, at least. And in that case, you had a minority of Chinese, but who were nevertheless somewhat more elite in the sense that they at least had more money and more business, uh, <coughs> more control of the business economy. Uh, so I was I was wondering if that makes a uh, if that makes a difference in these cases and whether that could be the possi possible basis of some sort of trade off between a majority which has political control and an elite which is able to keep its uh, financial interests. Okay, well, let's take a third one. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jim, and uh, I come from the uh, Oromo Community Cultural and Information Center here in Washington D.C. And uh, you talked about a lot uh, about African countries and sort of you, you didn't say anything about Ethiopia. And I don't know if you're <laughs> familiar of the uh, political arrangements in Ethiopia, the minority which has armored to the teeth is dominating the government. And I come from what is called from the Oromo community, which is yes. almost about 40% of the population. And uh, we constantly resist and so on and so forth. Um, I was just wondering your views, how this conflict could be resolved in Ethiopia, uh, possibly through um, arrangements. As, as you know, the states were arranged on ethnic basis and, uh, you know, they're, uh, on a linguistic basis, rather, and uh, it was rather bizarre and, and, and very... There's three okay. easy ones for you. Well, you know, there's always a hazard if you give a comparative lecture that somebody will say, well, what about my country? <laughs> but I didn't think Lisa's country was going to be Syria. <laughs> <laughs> um, Syria after Assad. Um, I don't have the slightest idea. Remember, this lecture was all about how power sharing fails. Mm -hmm. And it fails in even relatively favorable circumstances. Serious circumstances are anything but favorable. I don't think the possibility of partition looks very good because the partition presumably would take the Alawi and put them in the same unit as the Christians and, the, and other minorities. Remember, of course, that the Kurds are also interested in a separate uh, state in, in Syria uh, and, and maybe a separate state with some considerable degree of independence. Um, the Kurds go back and forth from autonomy to independence depending on the conduciveness of the circumstances. So I don't know the answer. And I, I, what I know is that Syria 
doesn't present good, a good opportunity uh, for a sensible negotiation. We've had, I, the cases I talked about did have sensible negotiations, lots of them, uh, and they still had difficulties. So a fortiori, I think the Syrian story is going to be a very unhappy one. In what direction the unhappiness will proceed, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, then the question from the gentleman at the Hudson Institute. I, I, I want to encourage you to think about um, about uh, two different ways of ordering a society. One way is with unranked groups, that is parallel groups, each of which has a kind of, uh, has a full complement of classes more or less, although they may be based in different, in different resources. And the other is a, is a hierarchically ordered society in which the A's on top dominate the B's on the bottom. They tend to have different kinds uh, of, uh, of, uh, of trajectories. Uh, the latter cases when they, when they get uh, violent when they, when they disintegrate, tend to disintegrate uh, in a kind of social revolution. It may take a genocidal form as in Rwanda and Burundi. Um, the other cases uh, rather have to do with control of the state rather than a, rather than a class-based social revolution. Um, in Malaysia, I, want to, I don't want to concede for a moment that the Chinese had elite social status. No, on the contrary, um, both groups, if you want to just deal about with the Malays and the Chinese, had their own elites, and they had their own working classes, and they still do have. And they had, even both of them have peasantries. There are a million or more Chinese vegetable farmers in Malaysia. So um, they're just two different kinds of problems. It isn't, it isn't that one is easier than the other. Uh, and in Malaysia, I want to tell you that, that is, it's non-hierarchical. And finally, the gentleman from the Oromo Cultural Center. Yes, I've thought a lot about, about Ethiopia, uh, and you'll be glad to know inconclusively. Um, <laughs> the current situation in Ethiopia is what I want to call an ethnocracy. The Tigrayans uh, uh, dominate uh, politics. They are, a, a, as the gentleman suggested, a minority. There's not, it's not a democratic um, uh, 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 regime, and it's not a power-sharing regime. It's the facade of power sharing because all groups are represented at the center, but the strings are pulled by a particular uh, group. How to solve that conflict? We've spent actually quite a long time at the NED uh, talking about the Ethiopian conflict, including um, uh, uh, public sessions, uh, and uh, we haven't reached any results. So if you want a, a if you want a prescription for your country, the odds are excellent that I can't give you one. What I will tell you, <laughs> what I will tell you is this. Okay? Um, don't go down the road of rigidifying things. Consociation uh, freezes conflict. Um, the selective use of consociational devices without the veto might be good. Uh, if you add a centripetal electoral system even to a, a relatively hardened consociation, that might work out well. We have, by the way, in the 20 that we mentioned, there are four hybrids. So in Macedonia, for example, uh, there's a hybrid regime where Macedonians, because of their own internal divisions, cannot uh, conquer the polity on their own and they must always have Albanians with them. This is a vote pooling um, arrangement. It's, it's exigent because of the electoral system and because of group divisions. Um, but Macedonia also has an array of consociational guarantees agreed to in 2001. Um, if the extremes have the whip hand because they have more seats than the moderate middle, then the middle parties may be afraid to join together. So that's, that's another thing you have to look at. Who is it who is actually going to do the negotiating? Uh, in the end, uh, it's always going to be the moderates who do the negotiating, uh, and it's sometimes the extremists who end up reaping the rewards, as they have, for example, in Northern Ireland. Um, well, I've rolled on for too long about that, so let's right, take a we'll couple more. Have some more. I'll take them quickly, but I'm hoping at the end you will since you're presenting a, a rather gloomy prospect, I, I think, that, to the audience, yes. that uh, you might at least say some cases that you regard as relatively successful ones. So, <laughs> but uh, let's begin here now. Good evening. I'm Fatima Tliso from Voice of America. A little louder, please. Uh, I'm F Fatima Tliso, Voice of America. My question is about Russia. What is your vision for Russia? and uh, the Central Asia, Caucasus, um, maybe um, the former USSR area. Thank you. Can I answer that quickly? I, okay. don't, ha I don't have a vision for Russia. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
I mean, that's a species of the same sort of question that I, that I, I said you often get in this, in this <laughs> kind of uh, arrangement. Mondonga yes. Mokali, I'm a professor at the Marymount and Australia University. Do you see any linkage between ethnic conflict and a lower level of development? Thank you. Okay. Take one more and then another round. Joe Nelson, uh, American University School of International Service. Uh, possibly in uh, honor of Marty Lipset. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm wondering, Don, if you can um, uh, move uh, back from uh, specific arrangements and individual countries. You mentioned a couple of European cases where uh, social and economic development uh, has eased tensions and permitted changes in, in uh, constructive changes in, in arrangements. But you also noted that uh, often uh, economic and social modernization has the opposite effect. Can you tell us uh, anything about your thoughts uh, under what conditions or through what patterns might we look for an easing of tensions uh, uh, re uh, resulting from economic and, and uh, social change? Uh, maybe let's take one more now from Bill Galston. Hi, I'm uh, <clears throat> Bill Galston, a senior fellow at Brookings and uh, a NED board member. Uh, to what extent does external imposition ameliorate or exacerbate the adoption problem? I'll give you a specific case that this country has been wrestling with, Iraq. Uh, we had substantial power over the institutional arrangements of post-invasion Iraq, uh, which is a classic ethnically divided society. My question is, what were our options? And were there options that could have led to less ethnic violence and tension uh, than Iraq is now experiencing? Okay, um, the person who asked about the linkage between ethnic conflict and levels of development, there's no doubt whatever that there is less intense ethnic conflict in the Western world. There is certainly plenty of it, but much less intense than there is uh, in, in the world of, uh, of, of lower per capita income states. Um, I, let me just give you a couple of startling numbers. Canada has had a problem since the 60s. That is to say, it's had the question of Quebec nationalism. Do you know how many people have died in this ostensible conflict? No, one, exactly, one. The man who was the victim of the, of the mailbox bomb in 1960, anyway, during Trudeau's time, 1970 perhaps it was, exactly one. Belgium has had this, uh, an exacerbation of its problem since the 70s. Three deaths in 40 years. So uh, it's fair enough, I think, to say that not only, as Marty Lips had said, does economic development uh, do something to ameliorate ethnic tensions, uh, but it's, it, it particularly ameliorates ethnic violence. And as a matter of fact, the Western world has hardly had a deadly ethnic riot, that is to say, a riot in which the A's went out on the streets to kill the B's. Uh, s well, the United States hasn't had one of those since 1943 in Detroit. Um, so that the answer is yes. Now, uh, Joan Nelson asked whether, um, whether one can specify what kinds of social changes would ease tensions. Well, I confess uh, that I can't do that, um, but I, I do have a good excuse. I'm working on the institutional side. I am not working on the social side. I will tell you there are some, there, look, there are four really good cases around, and they, are, they do provide food for thought. Taiwan, 1947, had 
horrendous conflict between mainlanders and Taiwanese. These days, you can't even count how many mainlanders and Taiwanese there are if you want to, because there are so many mixed marriages. Thailand, in 1945, had terrible anti-Chinese riots in Naratiwa. Uh, the, uh, these days, uh, by my count, Ch uh, Thailand has had at least three Chinese prime ministers, inc including the current one. Um, uh, two other cases. Uh, our friend uh, Kwasi Prempe told us uh, about the Ghana story. Uh, and uh, in Ghana, they seem to have settled into a pattern where the Akan groups and the Eve groups compete, but they alternate in office and uh, they seem to be happy thinking about the prospect that five years down the road, we won't be in opposition, we may end up being in office, at least we'll have a good fair shot at it. Uh, and another case that's just like that is Trinidad. Alternation in office in Trinidad between uh, Afro-Trinidadian parties and East Indian parties seems to have convinced Trinidadians that if the other guys get into power, we won't be killed. And that's really the acid test. It, it's the question of legitimate fear about will it be in perpetuity? Will there be a next election? Uh, and, and how severe are the consequences going to be for us? But if you tell me what it is that, that, that's responsible for these changes, I think I can tell you that first, about the first two. That is, I think I can tell you uh, that in Taiwan, the presence of China was a very important threatening element that drove the parties together, and the Guomindang had some pretty uh, good leaders who understood that they had to incorporate Taiwanese uh, into the polity. Uh, and in Thailand, the Chinese themselves insinuated themselves into um, the, uh, the networks uh, around military and civilian elites, and they also uh, practiced intermarriage. Notice something very important in Thailand that isn't present in a great many other states, no barriers to intermarriage in Thailand. Um, if you contrast that with Malaysia, where there are barriers to intermarriage, you see that, that one, 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 uh, one route is, is, is open in one country and it isn't open in the other. Uh, Bill Galston's question about external imposition. Well, the United States played a very peculiar role in Iraq. It, uh, it endorsed a constitutional commission which sat. At first, you will recall, we did, made a huge mistake because the first elections were by list system proportional representation. I'm sorry about the, the terminology with the whole, the, the, the country, the whole country has one constituency as in the Netherlands and in Israel. List system PR, one constituency. The Sunnis boycotted those elections and as a result they had essentially no or very little representation in parliament and it was parliament that was going to form uh, the constitutional assembly. Why did they do that? Because they didn't know how many people lived in each province so they couldn't do provincial lists. In the next elections, lo and behold, they did provincial list system PR elections. How could they have done that? They still had no census. <laughs> they, they used ration cards as a proxy for population. That is, they, they issued, the government had, the Saddam government had issued ration cards and therefore they knew how many were there in each province and so they approximated the representation by province. If, had they done that the first time around, the Sunnis, no matter how few votes had been cast for their representatives would have been represented. So it was a gigantic uh, mistake in the administration of the electoral uh, arrangements. Now, let me come back to the significance of this. I don't want to beat around the bush. The constitutional commission that was appointed became a cabal of Kurds and Shia. The Kurds essentially convinced the Shia that it would be a good thing to have a lot of devolution in Iraq and it would be a good thing uh, to have the possibility of amalgamating provinces into regions. I say they convinced the Shia, but no, actually they convinced the Shia, the largest Shia party in the south, which, interestingly enough, did not control Basra. There was pluralism in the Shia, in the Shia constituencies in the south, and Basra is where the oil is. So regionalization sat very well with the interests of a party that controlled the south, but not Basra. It could then control the oil in the south. And this 
the Americans said, oh, you can't do that. You can't have a cabal of two groups against the third large group, never mind all of the other groups. By the way, Iraq has been portrayed as a, a triangular society. It's not that. There are many, many groups in, in Iraq. Uh, there are Turkmen's and Yazidis, and, and I, one could go on and on. But the point is that the, the, um, the Americans said, no, so you can't do that. So the commissioners then co-opted some Sunni representatives into the commission. But they continued to meet separately at night. That is, the Kurds and the Shia did. So we didn't actually have the, the rights to impose. The, furthermore, the commission was very poorly advised. The Americans who were there weren't the right people to be on the scene. Uh, and they weren't all that helpful to the, excuse me, to the commission. The result is a, a very badly flawed constitution. And I'm coming to the real answer to your question in a second. But uh, a very badly flawed constitution. And the commission had another six months if it wished to deliberate six, six months longer. The Americans said, no, get it done now. Why did they say no? You may be cynical and you may think that the Bush administration was trying to make itself look good by showing an achievement. No, it turns out they were trying to make the Iraqis look good so that they could make some progress uh, in democratic institution building. I have this firsthand from somebody who was on the scene. In Iraq, if they had uh, the proper electoral arrangements, and here I mean some sort of vote pooling arrangement, there, is con there was and is considerable support for voting across group lines. Iyad Alawi, for example, regarded as a very bad Shia, managed to get support from more than one group, mostly Sunnis, it's true. Um, in, in the last, uh, last election, he got uh, more seats uh, than uh, Maliki and the Kurds did, uh, or the Kurds did, um, and yet he wasn't able to form a government because um, the negotiations didn't pan out. But the fact that there was um, a, a predisposition on the part of many Iraqis to vote across group lines suggests that they would have responded very well to some centripetal electoral arrangements. You can be dead sure that nobody on the Constitutional Commission knew anything about electoral systems or about how you might engineer something that might bring out this latent tendency among Iraq Iraqis. Many Iraqis from the United States were astounded, including some of the best informed ones, were astounded to find um, that politics had polarized around the three main groups. They thought that there would be a politics of, uh, of, uh, uh, of cross-ethnic uh, affiliations. Okay, just a little bit of time left, but let's see, we have four questions. Let's try to take them as fast as we can. I'm David okay. Epstein from the Defense Department. Uh, someone might hear your talk and think that it presented an argument suggesting that democracy promotion in these cases is not really a good idea. And if you're not drawing that conclusion, could you explain some of the thinking or evidence that leads you not to draw that conclusion? Okay, that's... Um, hi, thank you. My name is uh, Fatima Asrar. I'm uh, a former SAIS uh, alumni and uh, current NED uh, uh, grant recipient in Yemen, thank you. Uh, I um, want to thank you for your lecture and just had a, a question about the national dialogue process that is taking place in, in Libya, Tunisia, and Yemen. And I'm encouraged to ask that uh, because of your comment about the international community. Um, and uh, in, in the case of specifically Yemen, uh, there is a push to get the national dialogue forward. Um, regardless of the complexities that are going on and the fact that this, the, the main actors uh, slash spoilers in, in, uh, in the scene are actually outside of the national dialogue. Um, but at the same time, the international community has this inclination to support the process because that's the only thing they could do at the moment. Um, just want to know if you have any words of wisdom for the international community. Thank you. Hey, Carl. Uh, Don, so let me give you the Berber question. <laughs> um, for, for 50 years, the regime justified dictatorship on the basis of the, Ber the ethnic problem. Uh, and now they've declared their readiness to proceed to um, a managed democratic transition. Do you, from your visit there, do you see anything to lead you to believe that they're seriously committed to uh, dealing with this problem? And if so, uh, how, might it be, how might it be dealt with? And, um, what might the ethnic groups themselves have to do to try to reach a deal? At last, Jitman. 
Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, my name is Jitman Basnet, human rights lawyer and journalist from Nepal. Currently, Reagan Faisal Fellow at uh, National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, I will ask only one question today because uh, Don is Don's room is just next to next to my room. Uh, my question is: What is your views on uh, reservation? Uh, like a quota based on uh, the population. Uh, we have seen um, some of the countries have practiced, for example, India, uh, since 1949, um, India has mentioned uh, reservation for some groups indefinitely, and, and we have seen uh, protest uh, time and again. And we, in Nepal, uh, where more than 100 ethnic groups, uh, and we have 45% reservation for you know minorities. So, what is your views and ideas about that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, I think the first question was Mr. Epstein. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Um, look, I, I, I said that for today, uh, during the lecture, I don't want to talk about which is the better set of answers, but I'm quite clear that the centripetal way of going is a much better way of going, and let me give you some evidence that suggests that. In the first place, most obviously doesn't involve vetoes and therefore produces less immobilism. It gives moderates who pool votes relief from dangerous intra-ethnic competition and outbidding. That is to say, if the moderates in the middle can, from two groups can outvote the extremists on both ends, they have something they can count on. That is, they've got, uh, they've got votes from the other group as well as from their own, whereas if they're only attending to the interest of their own group, they are vulnerable to intra-ethnic outbidding. There's a book by Stephen Wilkinson on um, uh, uh, anti-Muslim riots in India, which is pertinent to this point. It isn't where he started out. What he started out to study was, why do you get riots in some states and not others? And what does he find? He finds that in states where the ruling coalition is dependent upon the votes of Muslims, there isn't any uh, anti-Muslim violence. Isn't that an odd conclusion? <laughs> uh, and, and, and he can show this um, uh, with very solid statistical uh, evidence. Um, the, in every one of the stalemated consociations, there have been proposals for centripetal electoral systems in Belgium and Bosnia and Northern Ireland and Cy Cyprus. The same diagnosis that no candidate is appealing to members of groups other than his or her own. Um, consociation has got a lot of pathologies attached to it. I won't bore you with that. Um, but there's a growing uh, literature on uh, consociation, especially in Africa where power sharing has been attempted and usually has not succeeded. And the literature seems to show uh, that um, a consociation that is inclusion of all groups undermines competitive elections because the losers get into government even when they lose. Um, the, uh, there are also oversized cabinets, bloated expenditure, why you've got to pay off everybody. Right, uh, consociation violates Riker's law of the win minimum winning coalition. You know that law, right? That is, the law says, why is it that ruling coalitions are closer to 51% than to 100%? Well, at 51%, you can give out twice as much to your supporters <laughs> as you can at 100%. <laughs> So consociation is in clear violation of Riker's law. And then there are those con cases in Africa, especially where uh, militias have fought their way into government. And a study by Mailer and Tull suggests um, that um, this lesson is learned from one country to another, that you can fight your way into government. And then if you're really good, uh, as in the case of either Sierra Leone or Liberia, you can get uh, the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Natural Resources, and then you can really uh, loot the country without having to, uh, to, to raise your rifle. So uh, what I want to say is the centripetal system is a better, is a better bet, um, and a lot of people are coming around to that point of view. But that doesn't mean that it's easy to get to it. It's very difficult to get to it. It's the adoption problem all over again. Majorities don't like it. Now, if you say, under what conditions uh, are you likely not to have majority domination? Oh, that's easy, multipolarity. 
uh, the Indonesians don't have a single majority. And the electoral system they adopted, which is a list PR system, reinforces their pluralism. So I don't read me as saying that in every case, list system PR is no good. I think you have to know what the starting conditions are. Uh, I'd like to refer to the tyranny of starting conditions. If you have multipolarity, don't adopt an electoral system that will turn it into bifurcation. Go with list PR, it's a good idea. Um, the next question had to do with the national uh, dialogue in, uh, in, in Libya, Tunisia, Yemen. I haven't followed them very closely, but I will. I have followed the Libyan one a little bit. Um, and in Libya, they made a big mistake at first. Um, when they had the first elections, they apportioned constituencies simply by population. And by population, Tripolitani is much more populous uh, than the other two regions are, than Cyrenaica or, or uh, Fezzan. Uh, but that was a gigantic mistake because the people in Benghazi, when they saw the election results, said, we're losers in this game. So that when they, when they um, adopted the statute for um, the constitution-making body, uh, they apportioned the constituencies by population 20 to, not by population, by, by region, 20 to each region. Uh, and for the sake of inclusiveness, this was a very, a very good idea. The, uh, uh, I, I don't usually think that this kind of quota is a, is a good thing, but it certainly um, mitigated the disaffection of the people in, in, in the East. Um, so what's the, what's the, what are the words of wisdom? Well, there aren't any general words of wisdom. It's to know your starting conditions and know also that the first few decisions you make will set you out on some path. There's a lot of path dependence in this, in this field. Burma. Uh, uh, Carl was very kind to call it a managed transition uh, because the military has been managing it uh, <laughs> and, 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 the, and the others are in transition to some future state they know not. Um, the, the, yes, I think there's some commitment, uh, but what's the commitment to? It's not going to be uh, to having uh, majority rule without the military, not in the early stages anyway. The military is far too embedded in civilian uh, uh, roles and the, 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 the minorities around the periphery and the Burman majority um, has, it has been so isolated from the world for so long. We're talking now about uh, 1962, really. So isolated from the world that it isn't ready to, to displace the military just yet. So if the military goes gradually, that's probably the better way to have it happen. Certainly they're going to keep control of the executive. I think they're going to have quite a a free election for the legislature, um, and it may be that Aung San Suu Kyi's party, the NLD, will have a majority in the legislature, although I think that's not a foregone conclusion. I think the military's party uh, is going to use patronage to get a, a reasonable number of seats. Uh, and of course, the minorities are more or less 40%. Nobody knows. There's never been a decent census, and there can't be a good one now, although one is hoped for. Um, the minorities have about 40%. Will they support Aung San Suu Kyi? It depends on which, which group you're talking about. Maybe the, 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 the Buddhist minority among the minorities will support her party. I'm not sure uh, that, say, the Kachins are going to support her party. The Kachins are mostly Christians, and they're probably not going to. Uh, and so this is going to be highly variable, and it's possible that there won't be a clear majority, that, that there'll be a three-way split, the minorities, NLD, and, and, the, uh, and the, the party that's being now... Um, uh, sent into the world by the by the military. Um, I think this will be a long, slow, painful process, and the minorities are going to have a very hard time uh, getting the kind of recognition that they need for participation at the center, because I think my read is that, that the, the regime thinks that federalism is going to be just great for Burma. Let those people rule their own areas. We can't be bothered with, with those areas anyway. But but don't let them exercise any power at the center. That's going to be a Burman thing. And I think what you're seeing with respect to, uh, to a kind of Buddhist revival in politics uh, has a lot to do with the correspondence of, uh, uh, of Buddhism with the Burman identity. It looks to me a lot like some others uh, that I've seen among some uh, Buddhists, for example, in Sri Lanka. Um, where were we? That's Final Carl. Okay, the last borders. question. Reservations. Oh, yes. Mm. Uh, I've been counseling off and on a person in, in the south of Libya who belongs to a minority group. Uh, I won't say more about the identity, but, but um, that person asked me, what about reservations? What about reserved seats? And you might think that somebody who's interested in vote pooling wouldn't generally think 
well, of reserved seats. Of course, it all depends. The Lebanese system of ethnically reserved seats with common role elections has, despite everything in Lebanon, produced a lot of vote pooling and cross-ethnic alliances and a lot of moderation uh, in a country that otherwise has got very bad conditions. Um, so I looked into the research on reservations, and lo and behold, I found some pretty good studies that show that reserved seats, all else equal, as if they ever are, um, uh, all else equal reserved seats tend to bring to the, to the uh, constituents of the reservations more public goods than unreserved seats would. So this is an interesting finding, and you have to take account of it. But I don't think it's a, a, the, the best way to deal with every group in Nepal. No, I, it seems to me we're talking here about very small groups that otherwise might have difficulty winning their own seats. And those groups, although you might think that it's just window dressing to have them in the parliament, those groups may very well be able, through their representatives, uh, to bring back uh, some, some public goods to, their, uh, to themselves. Well, thank you very much, Don, for a tour de force. <laughs> and, uh, John.